Okay, hi everybody. Uh, in this short video, we're going to talk about uh, adjusting data structures for parallel contexts. Basically, we're going to be looking at uh, cases that are a little more complicated where we may need to use multi-threading, but we also have a more complicated lock scheme. Uh, obvious examples of that are anytime we need to use a more complex data structure and maybe access that data structure in parallel. So hopefully at the end of this lecture, you'll be able to make a data structure thread safe or identify if it's unsafe, uh, create some parallel semantics for your data structure. Basically, does how does your data structure work in parallel and does it make sense in parallel? What are the, what are the conditions for it to execute in parallel? And also show a trade-off between what we call fine grain locking and coarse grain locking. And we'll get into what that what those two terms mean as we go through. So uh, a very simple case that we've looked at so far is maybe you have a data structure that you want to access on multiple threads. So far we've used simple integers or floats. Well now maybe we have a set. So a set is some kind of set object uh, and this object has an add function. So you add something in the set. This is fine um, as long as you don't access it in parallel. If you access it in parallel, we can't guarantee that set is thread safe. Add, the add function may not be thread safe. So thread one trying to add something and thread two trying to add something could cause data to be lost or some other mistake. So a very simple solution to this is to uh, use mutual exclusion, add a lock. Let's add a mutex and grab the mutex every time we want to modify S. And this has worked so far. And this works um, in, most, in many cases, uh, but there may be unforeseen consequences, which we'll get into as we go along. Uh, but first, let's take a look at some good uh, software engineering, how to implement this in a way uh, that doesn't require us to insert so many lines of code every time we want to use set s. So here's an example of a wrapper class uh, where we've made a thread safe set. So our class contains the same set that we were using before and a mutex. And so every time we call add, we lock our mutex and we call the original sets add. So this is just a wrapper that contains some thread safe semantics. It ensures that our set is always guarded. Um, and this is, a, this is an easy strategy if you, if you need to use a, um, a data structure that isn't thread safe. You can, you can just wrap it in another object and provide that safety yourself. And then you don't have to add locking code every single time you want to access S. Uh, so an example moving forward is, um, or uh, you know, a more complex example is this blocking queue. So we know how queues work. We'll pull up a short little example here. So a, our queue here in the middle uh, is first in, first out, right? So A was added in here, B was added in here, and A will be the first one to go out when we call pop. Okay, and or if we were to add a C in here, we would call push to add C. This is commonly, this kind of uh, strategy is often used in what we call this producer consumer model. Some threads produce data for your queue. Some threads consume data from the queue and then do some processing on it. So uh, in the example code that we have looking at here, we, uh, you know, we have our push, we have our pop. When you call pop, you grab a lock. When you call push, you grab a lock. Um, and you, know, you perform your operations and then you release the lock. Something that uh, is new in this code is something we call a condition variable. Basically, this is a way that we can access a more advanced, this is a more advanced way that we can use locks. Basically, you set some condition and 
uh, you wait on that condition to be true. So in this case, we want to pop. And the first thing we'll do is wait for some condition to be true. If it's true already, we continue executing. If it's false, we go to sleep. Um, we will be woken up again maybe later uh, by ourselves or maybe if we're explicitly woken up. So we wait on this condition. Maybe our condition, maybe we are woken up down here in push when somebody calls notify one, meaning notify one thread that it is allowed to wake up and check its condition and the condition should be true. Uh, this is basically what, the, what happens is uh, when we want to add something, we, we uh, can add something to the queue. Our consumer will keep consuming out of the queue. And maybe we have several consumers. Maybe we have 10 threads that are consuming. So we'll consume A, right? We'll consume A, we'll consume B. Now our queue is empty and we're waiting on the producer to produce. But we have nothing to consume. And so we'll go into pop to try to pop the next element. We'll grab our lock and we'll check if our queue is empty. And in our scenario right now, our queue is empty. So we'll go to sleep, right? It doesn't make any sense to pop something off the queue if nothing is in the queue. Uh, so we'll wait for push to be called. And when push is called, we'll be notified to wake up. Okay, that's how this works. Uh, this is a problem though, when we want to end our code or move on to something else. If we entered here to pop and the queue was empty and there's nothing else, we will never wake up. Uh, and so this is a condition that we need to consider. We need to add some functionality to our queue that allows us to wake up when we're finished or wake up under other conditions besides um, you know, the common use case of new data has been added. So uh, some examples are maybe we push some items in, just enough items to wake all the threads up and let them get out of this function. This is a little awkward. This, doesn't, this isn't ideal. This, this makes our data structure a little clumsy to use. We may be better off adding a function that will wake up all of the threads and cause them to exit our data structure code um, you know, with an exception or a return value that says you know, we, we were woken up, we didn't do what we were supposed to do. Something to this effect, just something to get all of our threads to wake back up and they're not stuck waiting forever. Uh, but without making our data structure awkward to use and have unclear semantics. So um, moving on. Um, when we write parallel data structures, it's usually important that we consider what we actually need to do and how we need to do it in the context that this code will be used. So what I mean by that is we want to define a data structure that um, it's usually helpful to define a data structure where we understand what its use cases are. We understand it will be used in this parallel context. Um, and we can uh, you know, write code and write an interface that is suitable to achieving that goal and maybe nothing else. It may be um, that to make sure, as you add functionality to data structures that are parallel safe, you have to consider that any number of your functions can be called at any given time. Uh, so we need to consider it. So in here, we have an example where we've added code to wake ourselves up. We've added functionality. We've added the functionality that will test if we are uh, finished executing and added functions that check, are we done? Uh, so meaning, is the queue empty and we're done executing on some, some variable that sets our, some finalized variable, some finished execution variable? Um, and an all done function that is called at the end and uh, sets done to be true, notifies everybody to wake up, we consume the rest of the items in the list, and then uh, once that's done, we, everybody exits cleanly and everything is good. Uh, if we know what our data structure is doing, 
we maybe can actually execute a better strategy than to lock the entire data structure. So in this case, we're showing an example of a hash table. Maybe our hash table has buckets. Maybe within those buckets, you know, you have a linked list. We've got, the, um, for example, this is words and counting the number of words that are, uh, you know, maybe the number of times the word within appears in a text document is, is an example that you would use this. So each bucket has a list. Um, and that list depends on your hash function. And we add things to the list by some key. Uh, and we, we insert our value. So um, the way that you would actually execute add is you, you uh, index into your bucket. You hash your, by the hash of the key. And then you add um, you know, the new value for the count to the, so for example, if we wanted to add a new value, say we counted five withins, so we would find out what bucket within is in, which is zero. Uh, then we would add within, we change the value to be five, okay? And uh, in this case, hash is reentrant because hash just computes some math on some key. Um, so what we can do is create uh, a finer grain lock. So instead of locking the entire hash table, maybe we just lock one of these buckets or each of these buckets. So we have a lock for bucket zero, we have a lock for bucket one, we have a lock for bucket two. And while you're in this bucket, uh, nobody else can be in this bucket. So depending on how big our hash table is, this can give us a large degree of parallelism where you only need to hold the lock if you're accessing the data in the bucket meaning that threads don't have to wait on the entire hash table to be free. Each bucket can be worked on independently. Um, you know, there's trade-offs here. You might end up having a lot of locks if you do that. If our hash table is huge, if we have 10,000 buckets, 100,000 buckets, a million buckets, that means we have a million locks too. So it, it can get complicated. You want to understand these trade-offs. Um, also, initializing the locks could be expensive, especially if they're not simple mutexes. It could just be that the time you spend working on the locks has a lot of overhead. Uh, so there's some trade-offs, right? You can, you can share some of the locks between some of the buckets. Uh, that increases the chance that you have what we call collisions, which are just you know multiple threads trying to access the same bucket. Uh, it creates less locks to manage, but you know you spend more time waiting potentially. Um, and for uh, people who are very interested in math, uh, the birthday problem gives us kind of a theoretical framework to work in. Um, usually, if you can have the number of threads squared locks, that gives you a pretty good chance of avoiding. Locks. If you don't know what the birthday problem is, uh, you might want to give it a Google. It's basically just the chance that two people share the same birthday in the same room, which is an analogous problem to what are the chances that two threads need to access the same data at the same time. Um, okay, so to sum it up, kind of, uh, it's a little more effective to lock individual parts of a data structure as long as you manage it correctly so that more threads can access different parts of the data structure at the same time. But you have to be careful when you do this to ensure correctness. So we're going to look at a short example of a binary search tree. So uh, hopefully you're all familiar with search trees or binary trees in general. But the idea is that, you know, if you want to search the tree for some value, then you'll execute an algorithm that involves looking at each node in a specific order. Maybe you do a depth first search like I'm doing with my cursor uh, until you find the value that you're looking for. Depth first, if you're finding a specific value, that may not be the best algorithm. If it's sorted, you may want to do something else, but, um, I digress, the idea is we want to execute some different algorithms on this tree. Uh, one strategy is we could lock the entire tree. Uh, however, uh, that means we can't operate on the tree in parallel at all. 
Um, so you take one lock for you know, an average of d time, where d is the amount of time that it takes to access, you know, to perform your algorithm access each, on each node. Um, we could have one lock per node. Uh, this requires us to grab more locks, which has some overhead associated with it. As we go along, we grab a lock here, we check our value, we unlock, we go down here, we grab a lock, we check our value, we unlock. Um, but then you actually don't need to hold the locks for any particular amount of time. So what this creates is a kind of trade-off in time. We add overhead for locks, but we allow more parallelism. And this is a common trade-off that you may have to make uh, as we analyze these data structures is, uh, does, allowing the does adding the parallelism, the overhead of having parallelism cause problems? Uh, and the answer is it depends. You have to analyze this on a case-by-case -case basis uh, and see what your trade-off is going to be. Um, so we can have some other strategies. What if each thread was working on its own set of data? Maybe we can make copies of data, then we don't need locks. Um, you know, that requires us to have certain conditions like read-only, or maybe we, maybe it's not read-only, maybe we each operate on an independent set and then we merge our data at the end. Uh, so that can be very efficient. You can work in full parallel, but then you have to have a reduction operation at the end, and the reduction has an additional cost associated with it. So we have to do some analysis to decide what to do, and a lot of it is case by case. Um, you know, another strategy, maybe we want to do some batched insertion. Maybe, so if, insert, if we're inserting into a tree, we're inserting into a hash table, maybe we want to wait until we have 10, 50, 100 elements to insert. Then we can grab the lock, insert all the data at the same time. We have no need for a merge, but, you know, we need to wait on data to show up. Um, we need some more information about uh, our data structure to understand how effective this is going to be. So again, case by case basis, but this is a strategy. Batching is a very effective strategy for a lot of operations that are very expensive or perhaps require a lot of locks. Uh, and you might want to check out some current data structure libraries that we have listed here. All right, we'll see you all in the next one.